I have for Uganda is different than the one I'm giving you. But don't we live in amazing times? When you see the UAE and Bahrain and others wanting to make peace with Israel, that's an, that, listen to me, that's, and you just see literally time speeding up. And so these are times that we need to keep looking up. And I just thought, I just want to carry on a little bit more with the theme of the end times and what God is wanting to do in these last days, because I truly believe that the greatest days of the church are ahead. You need to think about the generations that have gone on before us, but you and I are in a generation that are witnessing the end of all these prophetic words given thousands of years ago. You gotta pinch yourself. You know what I'm saying? That God, I am alive at this time, that God chose me in the whole continuum of history, that I would be here, that you would be here, is that not a miracle? I mean, it's amazing. So I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because I want to talk about the shortness of the time and how we need to really adjust our living according to what we're seeing around us. And Paul addressed it back then in his day. And verse 29 to 31, just a short text here out of 1 Corinthians 7. It said, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. Everybody say the time is short. The time is short so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they have none. Um. <laughs> well, I, I didn't think about that till right now. <laughs> I've got scripture for this, but anyway... Let's, let's carry, let's continue to read. Um, okay, those, you threw me off. <laughs> those who weep as they that did not weep. Those who rejoice as they did not rejoice. And those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it. Whoo. For um, the form of this world is passing away. Father, we want the reality of what's happening in the world and what your word declares to drop in our own spirit. We want to be more attentive. We want to live our life on the tips of our toes. Being ready to move at the slightest indication that your spirit's telling us to move. We don't want to be lethargic. We want to be sharp. We want to understand the times of the Lord. And so we can fulfill that which you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The time is short. I looked at the word short in the Greek. Sustelo. That means to bring together, to contract to shorten. I could have thinking about short. And then I thought about the word shortening. You know what women, you know what shortening is? You know, it's basically lard that solidifies and can sit on the shelf. Crisco. We think of Crisco. I got to think of, why do we call it shortening? Does anybody have the, why would we call lard shortening? Can I, can I, can I, can I tell you? I had to look this up. This is crazy. Uh, in the molecules in the flour, in the glucose matrix, what shortening does is shorten the molecule, therefore rendering the crust flaky, crumbly. You know, we hear about shortbread, and, you know, it's, it's all about, we know that's crumbling. I know it's not a cooking class, but <laughs> I thought it was interesting that the word shortening is about making things short that you cannot see. <laughs> is this interesting? Because I never thought about shortening. People just call shortening, shortening. But now you know why they do. 
you're like, golly, Mabel. But listen, <laughs> he is saying the time is short. It's the same verb. It's, there, there is a, there's a shortening of the time, meaning that as we press into the coming of the Lord, everything is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. It's happening in a more rapid fashion. And so we got to be on our toes. And Paul said, that was back then. He said, listen, be careful how you view your life relationships. Don't allow life relationships to pull you away from the reality of his coming and the importance of your ministry and your destiny. Don't allow your possessions and chasing after stuff to overrule what God is going to do because when he shows up, what really matters your possessions. But it has to focus on him. And I'm telling you, it's a warning to us. The Bible talks about this in Revelation 1-3 that keep those th things that are written in it for the time is near. Now this was written 2,000 years ago and I get tickled whenever I hear people go to heaven and back and Jesus tells them, tell the people I'm coming very soon. Tell the people, well, some, some of them were 40 years ago, 30, I'm coming very soon. So soon must be getting sooner than soon. And now must be very soon. So the time has got to be shorter so than 30, it's ever I'm been. I'm coming very soon. But there, has an, but there is an urgency in the times we live. The Bible prophesies about lawlessness. You know, when I'm landing in Seattle, I says, what's with, the, what's with all the fires? He said, they're being lit. That's lawlessness. You know, when people barricade themselves in a city and no one does anything about it, there's lawlessness. When you've got mayors of cities standing with the protesters trying to pull down a federal building, that's lawlessness. When you say, listen, let's defund the police. Yeah, let's, let's, let's throw away law. Let's just have lawlessness. No, no, no. no we live in the world where the Bible prophesies. He talks about this in 2 Corinthians 2, um, 7. He said that, the, that there's a mystery of lawlessness is already at work because we know the spirit of Antichrist is the spirit of lawlessness. And the closer he comes, the more lawless things become. And some of the things you'd have a hard time imagining would happen in our country are happening today. And everybody, let's... I could not live in Seattle. They are so law. Uh, it's, it's, they got this lawlessness on one side. But the place is full of Barney Fives. I have never seen a four-lane highway where the speed limit is 25. And everybody does it. Or another one, 35. Screaming at Seattle, screaming is 45. I wouldn't live there because of the speed. I just can't live there. I'm sorry. I just... You know, in Atlanta, I'm used to Atlanta, where 285 is a, a, is a form of the Grand Prix. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> bam, 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 bam. I mean, just, whoa, your adrenaline gets up, hallelujah. Whew, look in the rear view mirror, side leg, check everything all the time. You don't, be, you don't lollygag in our highways. You know what I'm saying? You, just, you cover yourself with the blood and say, Lord, I pray I make it in Jesus' name. But anyway, you know, we love them out there. The Lord have to appear to me in person, say, thou shalt go to the West Coast. I said, God, that's a major sacrifice in Jesus' name. To protect myself, I'm going to buy a horse. <laughs> but, we have, but we have in America um, all kind of things happening. You know, it's been told by great men, we have freedom, but if you don't use your freedom to keep your freedom, you'll lose it. And they would prophesy to us, you can lose this freedom. You can become a police state like that. It's knocking on our door. The speech police. We're like we have YouTube and Google determining what is appropriate. Did you know YouTube says that the documentaries describing the Ten Commandments is inappropriate? Google says... Dennis Prager, Ben Shapiro are like Nazis. we got to ban them. So what they're doing is they want to control the narrative. The dialogue that we're used to going on in a, in a free 
nation with free speech. You get to share your speech or your talk. I get to share mine. Not anymore. We determine the narrative. So if you're a Christian, all of a sudden, if you speak out, oh, now you're a hate monger, and I've been called it a hate monger, a bigot, a homophobic. Get used to it, folks, because what's happening is the end times approaches, and Jesus says you'll be hated by all nations for my sake. And you're watching it. It's happening right now. Who'd have thought that they would tell churches in America, you cannot, not only can we uh, keep you shut, if we do open you at a minimal, you cannot sing. Really? The point is this. We live in a world, it's all about the upper powers trying to make you comply And to do things that's good for the world, but not good for Christian faith. And so I just love the fact we just push against everything. We push against it. Doing this missions gala, you know, the the poor hotel, they don't have nothing. They're about ready to shut down. We said, okay, would you please do the missions gala? We're doing the, the encounter. So we're going against pushing it back in Jesus' name. Us meeting here is the pushback. You know, when I talk to the pastors, they still haven't met. So it's a pushback. So I want to say, y'all, come on back. I mean, seriously, just, just, just come on back. It's okay. It's okay. Amen. But we need to get over this whole thing. When I read the thing about the TB, no one's, no one's highlighting the TB. Is that being news? No. Because I hate to say it, it's political in nature. It's not, it's not medicinal. It's political. I fully believe, well, I don't believe that. Well, we stand to differ, amen, and we love you anyway, amen? But I'm just telling you where I'm coming from, from a spiritual point. That's how I view it. And so in Matthew 24, if you'll go there, I want to go there for a little bit. There is, he says, Jesus was asked questions by the disciples about what about the end times? And in the Passion, it says this. He says, you can expect to be persecuted, even killed. For you be hated by all the nations because of your love for me. Then many will stop following me and fall away. And they will betray one another and hate one another. I tell you, the devil wants us to hate each other. He wants to polarize our cultures. And put narrative out there which really works at polarizing the races. And it's planned by the enemy. And then you'll fall away if you don't walk the word that says, you know what, I'm going to love you no matter what color you are, no matter what you say, I'm going to love you, period. If you allow the narrative of our world, like, listen, please, if I would tell you as a pastor, limit your news. If you suck on the news, and I mean all of them, you suck on the news, you're going you're to be a very depressed, negative person. And they will twist your thinking. They really will. They'll manipulate you. But you've got to understand, I'm going to be manipulated by the word of God. I'm going to walk without fear. I'm going to walk in love. I'm going to reach out to people. I'm going to do the things that we need to do is go out to all the world and preach this gospel. We are pushing it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. And so we're going to launch our mission trips as soon as we are looking right now how we can launch our first trips, what's opening up right now. And it's going to be, we're going to go out the door. You know what we're going to be? We're going to be a watermelon pip squeezed between your thumb and forefinger. Pew! we be gone. We're not waiting around. We're going to be hitting it, man. We're going to go in Jesus' name. I'm watching Israel. I know they're on a lockdown right now, but praise God, when they come up, I'm going to go. I'm going to do a mission trip to Israel in Jesus' name. You all come. We're going to do things that just go against what the, what the narrative says you should do. Are you out there? Hallelujah. So quiet in here. But anyway, it says here in 24, 13, he said, in the last days, let me, let, me, let me go there myself, Matthew 24, where he talks about, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. That's why we've got to be about getting out this gospel. We've got to get about preaching in Jesus' name. Our teens are on the streets around the Seattle area every day. 
We passed out thousands of flyers. It's amazing. When you meet people one-on-one, they're hungry for God. We led many to Christ in that area. In every city we go to, we win people to Christ. We, we lay hands on sick and they get healed. The preaching of the gospel can never stop. Let me say this to you. You are a preacher of the gospel. Say, I am, I am. a preacher of the gospel. You can share your testimony. And I'm going to get this guy who I work with. His name is uh, John Duke. John Duke. Oh, I love this guy. Big old guy. And he's a soul winner. All he does is go on the streets and win souls. He does it right through the pandemic. He's winning souls. And he just, and I work with him just full of love and how he got saved in a bathroom stall full of the devil, full of hatred, going to try to kill himself, higher than a kite. And he says, God, if you're real, visit me. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God filled that whole cubicle. And he gave his life to Christ, even though nothing about it. He had to get someone to officially lead him to Christ. All he knew, he had an experience with God. I said, God, that's going to happen more and more and more. People are going to start coming. The, he'll take the hardest guy that's out there about ready to kill his life and win him to himself and bring him to make him use it as a, as a flaming evangelist for his kingdom. Amen. But everybody say, preach the gospel. We got to be about preaching the gospel. And so this is the time to stay awake, to live on your toes in Jesus' name. Get excited, hallelujah, and say, God, how can I be used of you? Because the Lord is coming soon, soon, soon. Get ready, he's coming. Matthew 34, that same uh, um, uh, scripture talks about this in uh, 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Talking about when Jesus, when, he, when Jesus is coming to rapture the church. But as the days of Noah were, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So will also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two will be in the ground grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed this house to be broken into. Wherefore, you also be ready. Everybody say, be ready. Be ready, be, be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour. That you do not expect. I'm telling you, there is no more prophetic word that needs to be given than what we've been given now for Jesus to come. He could come at any moment. And the time is short. I mean really short. I mean get ready. Get ready. You need to think about it. And I love the way he says, you know, in Noah's day, they couldn't look at the signs. What was the sign? The sign was that Noah was preaching. He was a preacher of righteousness. And he was building an ark. That was a sign. The ark was a sign to say, hey, what are, you, what are you building this big boat for? This coming a flood. I don't believe it. No, no, this coming a flood. This is a sign to you. Plus what I'm teaching you. And they wouldn't receive it. And they were taken out in a moment. It happened so rapidly when they least expect it. But you know what? Every sign is given to us. The signs when you've got Arab countries. I remember Hilton Sutton saying this. Hilton Sutton who gave his entire life to studying the book of Revelation and all the prophetic scriptures. He said there's coming a time just before he comes. The Arab nations around Israel will make peace with her just before he comes. We're in the ninth hour. The time is shorter than ever. We have to be looking at your life. Okay, how can I make my life count for this last hour? Is it going to be another 100 years? It will not be another 100 years. Will it be another 50 years? It will not be another 50 years. We cannot just go on eating, drinking like it's going to never stop. No, 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 no. The signs are there. It's too, it's too in your face. And the people of God have got to understand that this is their greatest hour. You remember Churchill? When the RAF stopped the Luftwaffe? And a few men. My dad was, not, was an RAF fighter pilot. I grew up with the stories. Whereas Churchill said, never in the history of mankind, have so many owed their lives to so few who stopped the invasion of Great Britain. And he even said to inspire them, he said, this will be known as Britons, this will be their finest hour. And it was. But I say this about the church. We are coming to the finest hour of the church. Well, they may not like you. They might try to shut you down. But God wants you to get a hold of these last days that he's needing you to preach this gospel.
to be fearless, to be bold, to understand that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony and their love not their lives to the death. Mean that if I die, I die. I get a promotion. I'm going to kill you. Oh, I'm going to heaven. So we have to understand the times we live in. They're going to be more dangerous and more things are going to happen. They may be disturbing. Jesus said in the tribulation, what's that word? You look it up in the Greek, it means pressure. People pressing against you. Pressing against your lifestyle. Pressing against your words. Don't say that. Breathe that. Sit down. Shut up. There's a pressing. Pressing. In the world you have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm excited to be in these days. I want you excited too. You know why? We win. We are on the winning side. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. And so we need to understand that he told us to watch, to be ready. The time is short. But let me talk about prophetic words. All these are prophecies. Jesus spoke this 2,000 years ago. Now we're living at the end of it. It's seeing its fulfillment. But prophecy is given for us so you can get warned. So you can prepare. Amen. Uh, I was demonstrating something where I think it was Joanne Funches at the Bible school. She said, well, why is it easier for you as a Christian, you hang around friends that don't love Jesus. It seems like I watch my friends, they get sucked in to the ways of the world. They hang around ungodly friends versus godly people infecting ungodly people. I said, because it's easier to pull someone down than pull somebody up. So I stood on the stage, and she's so funny. So I said, pull me up, little Joanne Funches. Well, what she did was I told her, pull me up. So she prepared to pull me up. Does that make sense? She was ready to pull me up. And when she got a hold of me, that dear little lady pulled me on the stage, ruining my illustration. <laughs> but the point is, she was prepared to do it. So this whole thing about prophecy is that you prepare spiritually. Are you, you're, you're set. You're not caught off guard. We have an advantage over the world because the world doesn't believe this. But that's okay. We want to love them into the kingdom in Jesus' name. So we're not caught off God. We're not caught. So we're prepared. And so God wants you to understand and to know these things so you can succeed and win in Jesus' name. He says they're going to hate you. Well, they're going to, that's happening right now. Isn't that funny? The law of the Christian is love your neighbor as yourself. And do unto others as you have them do unto you. I hate you. It's the Antichrist spirit. The law of the Christian is they, love your neighbor they as They hate yourself. the Christ that you and do unto have others it within as you. you have them do unto you. And so if you take I a look you. at the prophetic, I, I don't have time to get into it. You know what happens is I, they I love the scriptures. The I dive in, do have it I mine all this stuff that I come out. I said, I can't, it's just too much gold to share. But Matthew and Luke talk about that. We know about the revelation. It is called revelation. Because it brings revelation. It's, I don't understand the book of Revelation. It's so, confu no, go, so confusing. No, slow down. You can understand the book of Revelation. Revelation. You go to the book of Daniel. It talks about, in fact, Daniel and Revelation parallel. Exactly. And you take a look at others like Zechariah. Other scriptures are done. That's never God. He said, you missed it. He said, did he receive it? No, he didn't. But I want to let you know that's very powerful. When you think about it, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all of them. Yes, they would give a strong word, but always gave a word of hope. Amen? Let, put that, now don't be smoking a pipe, but put that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> let that kind of be a disseminator as you plow through, because everyone has an opinion, like everyone has a belly button. I got an opinion. Let me tell you what I saw. You had too much pizza. So I talked to Brother Ted. I said, I want you to come here because people are calling him. Major churches are calling him. In fact, a major church wants to have him for a week here. And I said, well, we're going to get you too. So the first year, we're looking at bringing them out. I may go week two. He said, I want to get the prophet in the house, speak to the people of God, and get us moving in the right lane on the right balanced lane. Amen. Without wigging to the left and wigging to the right. Can you everybody say amen? amen. 
So, but, but prophetic words are so, so important. And, you know, when you, when you get into this thing about 1 Corinthians 7, really, life's about Jesus. This world is about Jesus. He made it. The church of Jesus Christ is the ones that are bought by his blood. This focus of the heaven is about the church, the born again ones. And he wants the church to, break, to reach out to all those that don't know him. Do you realize when you were first born, your name was written in the last book of life? Everyone's name is in the book of life. God wants every person on earth to receive him and be made a son or daughter of God. Your name has to be blotted out. When you die and you've not received him, then your name is blotted out. That's not the plan of God. So it's all about Jesus. It's about the end times. It's about, it's, it's about centering around Jesus, lifting up Jesus. And Jesus, what, do you, what would you have this man do? What would you have this woman do? It's about him. And it's not about, we've got to be so careful. It's not about your houses, your cars, your kids, your, all the things that we think is important. If, it, if, if that sur, supplants Jesus and how you want more of Jesus, and it's very easy in business, especially when you start getting blessed, that church no longer becomes the vital part of your life. And all of a sudden you quit pressing into God. You quit pressing into prayer. It's very easy to shift especially in America, it's very easy to become comfortable. We have to deal with other Christians around the world. They're forced to stay on their face before God. Are you kidding? In Africa, you better pray in tongues for one hour just before you walk out the door. Don't get your head clocked. They have real demons there. But you see, I understand this. We got to be about, all about pressing into Jesus because we are living in the end of the age. Glory be to God. Now let's go to Matthew 4, 2. Uh, I mean, um, no, 24-2, where he says this. Watch this. They said, Jesus went out there, and disciples showed him all the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, do you see, not see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone should be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Has anyone been to Israel? You've seen the size of the, on um, the Wailing Wall, the how they're massive stones. 10, 15 feet long, four, five feet high, you know, I don't know how many feet wide. And this was a magnificent structure that Herod the Great built. It took him like 40 some years. He says, you see these stones? There won't be one stone upon another. He, now so, because part of 24, chapter 24, is talking about there that won't be time. One stone upon another. And we know this, 70 AD, General Titus from the Roman army came and destroyed Jerusalem and pulled down the temple, pushed down every wall, and at that time, there was a great dispersion. There was no more Israel that we know of today until 1948. So it's an amazing thing that Jesus, Jesus can prophesy exactly what will happen. So when he prophesies that he's coming soon, we've got to pay attention. So in Luke 21, 20 through 24, if you'll go there, Luke 21, I'm trying to break the paradigm of only one scripture per sermon. Amen. <laughs> Verse 20, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is, is near. He's prophesying the Roman destruction of, the, of Jerusalem. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let, and, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance and of all things that are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all, uh, all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of Gentiles be fulfilled. That is an amazing uh, prophetic word. He said, it's going to be taken out. Now, I don't want you to know that he was giving the warning. If you have a warning, he said, don't go to Jerusalem. When you see the armies coming, get to get. Get out of Dodge. I'm trying to help you. A prophetic word will help you. It will spare you from the destruction that's coming. But isn't it amazing? That from the time, 70 A.D., that Titus destroyed Jerusalem, that God prophesied that he'd be bringing back his people. 
That's never happened in the history of the, of the world. May 14, 1948, Israel was made a nation. And they resurrected a language that, was, that had died. The Hebrew language was dead. They resurrected it and spoke the Hebrew language. It's an amazing thing. So that time, and then in 67, Jerusalem was gained back to the Israel through this Six-Day War. A miracle of God. So in our own time, in my time, maybe not your time if you're younger, but in my time, we've watched this happen. And Jesus said, listen, when the fig tree begins to blossom, know that the end is near. You know what happened? He said, this generation should not pass until he shows up. What? The instigation of the beginning of Israel. I believe it with all my heart. There are different generations in the Bible. Some are 40, some are 60, some are 100. Depends where you want to plug in. But I'll tell you, we're in that time frame. We're in the time frame of the end days. Israel is the clock of Almighty God. For me, I've got a new thing. I just watch Israeli news. Because whatever goes on in Israel, it packs everything else. Israel is the center of the whole earth. Jerusalem is the center of Israel. And we know this. It, everything centers around Jerusalem. Armageddon is all about Jerusalem. In the millennial reign, it's all about Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. God picked a city in the center of the earth. That causeway, that bridge between Asia, Europe, and Africa. God did that. But we don't have to be dumb. Oh, well, what's going on? No, we don't have to wonder what's going on. You know exactly what's going on. He's setting things up. Amen. Amen. So the book of Revelation, which I love, uh, has the timetable. It's all laid out. You mind if I go through a quick cliff notes? Revelations 1 is an opening letter. As John is being, Jesus appears to John. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm he who was, who is, and is to come. I'm, I'm the one that had the keys of hell, death, and the grave. I want you to write these things. Now it is called a book of Revelation. The Bible says at Revelations 1, 1, all who read it will be blessed. So I've read it a lot because I want to be blessed. Don't ever say it's a mystery book. As soon as you say that, you speak death over yourself. Say it's a book of Revelation. Say it. it say Revelation, Revelation. is a, a book of Revelation for my life. For my life. Amen. Amen. And if ever we need to know it now, it's the time. Now I've done verse by word, verse exposition. I've spent nine weeks going through the whole book more than once. I may do it again. But chapters 2 and 3 is, is addressed to the seven churches that were in Turkey, present-day Turkey. And Jesus knew everything about every single church. He knew their strengths. He knew their weaknesses. But he commanded every one of them to overcome. You know what he's telling them on our vernacular? Buck up, buckaroo. You've got my anointing. You've got my name. You're designed to overcome. Don't get sidetracked. Watch out for the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans are those that take in the culture's values and the Christian values, stir them up and make it one pot. Jesus said, I hate that. And then you go through Revelations 4 through 19. So 4 through 19 is all about tribulation. The majority of the Bible and the book of Revelation is about the tribulation. And then chapter 21, I mean, uh, 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 chapters 21 and uh, 22, 20, 21, 22 is all about him coming again. Back to the earth and establishing his reign. But I love it. Don't, I tell you what, some of you should dig into. It's all very, very wonderfully laid out in Jesus' name. Through it all, people are getting saved. The, the church is caught up in the, in, the, in the rapture. You said, oh, but I don't believe in the rapture. But I do. There are two comings of the Lord. One, his appearing. Well, how do you know that? Well, number one, it's not known. His appearing is not known. One will be at the grill, at the mill. One will be taken, I mean, two will be at the mill. One is taken, another's left. As the lightning strikes the sky from east to west, so quick will the coming of God's appearing be. You'll see it, it'll be like the twinkling of an eye. That's the rapture. But there's a second coming when Jesus comes to judge this earth 
and we will come with him, the Bible says. And he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And that's where he destroys the armies of Megiddo. And like I said before, the second coming is known because you know what the book of Revelation is. It's a timeline. So the second coming is known, but the rapture is unknown. There's two separate comings. I'm trying to keep it plain because there's a lot of jargon out there that said there is no there is no such thing as a rapture. And we're all going through the tribulation. If you want to be a tribulator, help yourself. But I'm not going to be a tribulator. I want to have the power of God on me right to the very end and I know I'm being caught up. Well, you're trying to escape. No, I want to go everything for God I've got to go for. Does that make sense for you? Hopefully it does and you get excited about it in Jesus' mighty name. One of the things, can I tell you my favorite part about tribulation? The... You get to Revelation 8, and you're in mid-tribulation. Three and a half years, three and a half years. Mid-tribulation is where the Antichrist sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. He turns his back on the Israelis, who's man of peace for the first three and a half years. Then he becomes who he really is, Satan incarnate. And there are people getting saved throughout the tribulation. In fact, the tribulation wins more people to Christ than all the other ages put together. Because if you've got one eye and half a brain, you can feel it. Hey, Myrtle, reject us. But yet people will still reject God. They will still fight against him. But the mid-trib, they've got two mystery saints. We don't know where they come from. But they appear in the heart of Jerusalem where the Antichrist is. And the Antichrist has a prophet that does signs and wonders. Remember how the prophets of Baal, they had to call down fire they never could? This guy calls down fire. So he mimics God. And then he goes, worship the beast. He made an image of the beast. Worship the beast. He said, he's God. You got these two witnesses for three and a half years. Every day they stand out there in the streets of Jerusalem and say, he is not God. Would not that irritate you if you're an antichrist? Shut up. You are not God. And now God gives them divine protection. Whoever comes against them, they, have, they, can, they can speak out of their mouth and fire comes and consumes all enemies. They can point and things happen. They point to the sky, it will quit raining. They point again, it will begin to rain. They're unstoppable and completely protected for three and a half years. I love God. Don't ever tell me God is not in control. Amen. Then finally, they kill them, and they lay there for three and a half days. They don't, CNN carried it, Fox News, <laughs> MNBC. They had it up there, close-ups. They had reporters. Wah, 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 wah. We finally took care of these troublemakers. But then, three and a half days later, these guys start shaking and stand up again. Can you imagine the fear? Humma, 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 humma. Call the Antichrist. Uh, these guys have come alive. We'll capture them again. Psh, they start shooting up to heaven. Now get this. While they're watching the two shoot up to heaven there and they're, and they're reporting. Oh, we are just <laughs> All of a sudden, from the sky comes this light. And here comes Jesus with the millions of saints. And guess this. We're all riding horses. War riding white horses, hallelujah. My, my daughters and my wife went horseback riding this last week, and they said, we didn't know that um, you need to pray for more padding because you really, <laughs> bam, bam, bam. We said, I guess so you got to learn how to ride, amen. But horses are wonderful things. And they come in, and in one day, by the sword of his mouth, he annihilates 200 million people from the east. All the armies of the north, Russia, and all of the armies of, of Europe that come, they end up fighting themselves. And then when they see Jesus, they actually, actually start shooting at Jesus. This is not a good thing. If you want to tick Jesus off, shoot a nuke at him. I promise you this is not good. And so the Bible says he wipes him out. 
He wipes out the entire affair. And he sets up the new Jerusalem. It's not the new Jerusalem. He sets up camp right there in Jerusalem. And there's a thousand year reign of peace. Amen. There's no racial division. Think about this. There's no strikes. There's no war. Psychologists get out of a job. They lose their job. We don't need doctors anymore. We don't need undertakers. We definitely don't need the IRS. So <laughs> you'll find things that we thought we needed, they'll just drift. Johnny, Dr. Johnny, we won't need a dentist. You can find a beach and push white hot sand through your party sausage toast to your house content. <laughs> And then he says, after a thousand years, we'll stand all before the throne of God. And he'll raise up from the dead all those who've died who went to hell. He'll separate the sheep from the goats. The Bible says he'll destroy the earth by fire. It'll be melted to a crisp. It'll disappear. He'll make a brand new earth with no oceans. And then the very th heaven of heavens, New Jerusalem, 15 miles square, will lower and come down on this earth. And we'll reign with him forever and forever. So now all these things are right upon us. They've been given to us to encourage us, to inspire us, to warn us, to train us. But how about you? I'm excited. Because the song really rings in me better than it's ever done before. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Soon and very soon. This could be the rapture generation. You literally could be going to your car. And all of a sudden, you like, you do the Star Trek thing. When they beam you up, you begin to dematerialize and rematerialize. You start to take off. I've had dreams where I have flown. Has anyone had that? Just go. And then when you wake up, you have to quit flying. But I, I just want to fly. You think I drive fast? Wait till you see me fly. I tell you what. Let's see, how many can I fly around this, this earth? I'm going to do a few laps around the earth before we beam up to heaven. It's just around the corner. Just a few more happy days. And then we'll, I know the song says, just a few more. What's it say? Weary days. No, that's, change that. Just a few more happy days and then we're going to fly away. We're going to fly away. Come on, get excited. So no matter what you're going through, 400 traffic. <laughs> Getting a dentist have to put a new crown on your tooth. But somebody in my family needs one. She keeps putting it off. Okay, now down to three people. Who is that? No, I won't be quiet. But you know what I'm talking about. There are things you have to face that you don't want to necessarily do. But I tell you what, it's just, it doesn't matter because, well, I got a marriage issue. I got this. It, listen. Listen. Soon, we're out of here. Get excited. Do you realize when you've got Arab countries making peace with Israel, we're at the end of the end. Well, now, wait a minute. I want to have a family and babies. Well, that's okay. Have them as, just do the best you can. Well, I wanted to see my grand... Well, you know, you know what? Okay, it's grandbabies or the throne of God. I'll take the throne. Okay, okay. you know, uh, we... <laughs> Get these signs of Israel. Jeremiah 29, 14. I will gather you from all nations and from all places. That's a prophetic word. Another prophetic word. Jeremiah 33. I will cause them to return to the land I gave to their fathers. Amazing. Isaiah 66, 8. Shall a nation be born in a day? All these are signs. Yes, they were. Yes, it happened. And so we've got signs of the times. We've got, we have lawlessness on every side. People are just doing the most crazy things. I mean, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm in, the, I'm in the left coast. I get a call from a pastor, Danny D'Angelo. He said, have you heard what they did in California just this week? No. The governor signed a new law. Allowing pedophilia. Oh, really? A new law. 
Oh yeah, I looked it up and read the law. Here's what the law says. From 10 years on, you have a 10-year spread. If you're within the 10 years, you will not be convicted of a crime. That means a 20-year-old could molest a 10-year-old and it cannot be put in court. What's happening? Lawlessness. I've always said pedophilia, if you give it a length of time, will eventually be accepted. And then we move to bestiality. And then we move to God knows what else. It's just there's no end in sight. Well, what? Well, you know what? What, what should that do for us? Lawlessness abounds. He promises us. He says, listen, in Noah's day, he said they, he uses that at the end time. Look at, look at Noah. Or look at Lot. And they were judged because it was people that wanted to have sex with Lot. Guys, did you know that the Antichrist happens to be homosexual? So we understand what's happening in our world today is total perversion perversion and lawlessness it's against who against God but that's okay it means I'm going to fight it with all the faith I have and all the love I have with God I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's the hammer that breaks the chain the preaching of the gospel keep preaching the gospel keep meeting to get the gospel come on come on come on preach the gospel 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 get it out there get it out there that's why we got that tent out there that's why we gathered in the youth because all the stuff shut down we got stuff for you to come to and we're not going to stop we're going to have revival we're going to keep preaching we're going to keep preaching we're going to keep meeting preach the gospel preach the gospel in Jesus' name. And the Bible says natural disasters will happen. We're watching stuff happen. I won't go through the statistics. You could have earthquakes if you chart on the rise. Our own pandemic, an uh, international pandemic that would shut everybody down. These are the end of the end days. God said that these disasters will increase as we come to the end. And there will be also a great falling away. The Bible predicts it. There will be a falling away. First uh, Timothy 4.1. Then the last days there will be some that fall away from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It's going on all around us. Watch who you listen to. Don't be flipping through the YouTube. Listen to anybody. That person could distort your mind and thinking. You better be careful. Don't follow every prophetic word. Some of those are hooks that will pull you into the wilderness. You should check it out. Hey, Pastor Willie, what do you think about this guy? Turn him off. So the greatest day of the church is right now. I want you to get excited. I want you, listen to me, this is not the day of doom and gloom. The worse it gets, and the more they pressure against the church, and the more they persecute the church, which is going on around the world, and the more they call us hate mongers, and everything else under the sun. Get ready. Get ready. What time is it? We got plenty of time. Listen, uh, we got, because I'm a man of faith. I speak it in Jesus' name. Now listen, it says this, and I'm, and I'm wrapping up. I heard that, honey. <laughs> Behind every great man of God, there's a woman that says, you're not. But anyway, that's a joke. That, that was a joke. Because she is a great encourager to me. And I have a great wife. It's, it's called... <laughs> She has a great wife. To put up with me, she's great. Trust me, to put up with me. Yeah, when my uh, brothers told him, I said, what about him? He said, well, now you're taking a chance. He's kind of wild. <laughs> let's, let's get to the Bible. Folks, let's quit this. This is a personal thing. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you start those who have no hope. Then he drops down to verse 6, 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, that's essence, will by no means precede those who are asleep. I'm talking about those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, a war cry. Yeah! He's coming. With a shout. With the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. You're going to hear it. When you hear that, start, hey, 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 hey. Shut the barbecue off. We don't need it anymore. <laughs> Leave that for the Antichrist. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 
then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. I tell you, this is a scripture that wants to tell you, you have no right to be sad. You have only right to be glad. I'm telling you what, to be sad is someone that doesn't have Christ and looking at what's going on on the earth. We got to be the answer for them in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And so God, the Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, never appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Do you know what? There are 300 verses in the New Testament relating to the coming again. It's a major subject. Amen? He's going to appear. Then he's going to come for us in Jesus' name. So what's left for us? What do we do? We, these scriptures were given, all the prophetic words were given us to strengthen us. To put a smile on your face. face, To build your faith up in Jesus' name. And to stand up. Let God arise and enemies be scattered. I'm preaching on this on my third sermon today. Arise and shine. I can hardly wait to preach it. Because it's the church's greatest hour. Arise and shine. For the glory of God has come, does descend on you. And the Gentiles will come to your rising and kings, kings to your light. I tell you, these are the days that we need to shine for Jesus. Don't push back against the fear to be quiet. Don't allow people to shut you up at work. You speak boldly for Jesus Christ. Don't allow your life to come away from the ways of the news and want to shrink back. Don't allow that. You be bolder than ever. You pray for boldness. Decide you're going to do mission trips like more than you've ever done before. Decide you're going to reach out for the things of Christ more than ever before. That you're going to do works of God in Jesus' name. Andy Ellison, the principal of the Sweet Apple, called me this week. He said, could you help us? I said, what do you want? He said, we want to give lunches to these kids that, are, that some of them are still locked down. Could you help us give lunches to them and be a distribution point? I said, of course, Andy Allison. That's what we're all about. You see, I want to be on the front line where, where if a principal is going to call somebody, they're going to call us. If people want to need it, they're going to call us in Jesus' name. That's how I want it to be. We're not sitting down. We're going for it. We're going for it. We're doing it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Are you excited? Yes. He's coming soon and very soon. Hallelujah. Lift up your heads because your salvation is coming to you soon. Well, hallelujah. Here's the question I want to ask you. Bow your heads. Are you ready? That's the question I want to ask you. Are you ready? Are you living for him? You understand the time is short. He could come at any minute. What if he came last next week? Are you ready for him? Is your heart ready? Is your heart right with God? Are you ready? All these scriptures are to warn us to get ready. The five virgins had oil in their lamp. They caught up the Lord. They were caught up with the, when the Lord came, they were ready. But five were low on oil. They were left behind. Don't get left behind. Not everyone will be caught up in the rapture. It will be based upon your fire for God. It will be based upon your heart. I want to tell you right now, the lukewarm will not make it. Or you'll be going through the, tribu the tribulation, may have your faith built, and then you'll make it. But why go through that when Jesus has such a better plan for you? It's to be caught up to be with him in the clouds before this whole tribulation starts. So the question is again, are you ready? Search your heart. Are you ready? Sincerely, if Jesus appeared right now, are you ready? Well, if you're not ready, you can get ready today. This is a decision you make with your heart to say, Jesus, you know, I've got things I've got to take care of in my life. And I want to confess to you some sins. I want to confess to you some issues that I'm allowing in me that pushes me away from you. I tell you, this is very real. We need to live this way. With a tender heart before Jesus, before the Holy Spirit. But if you want to be ready, you've got to just search your heart. You've got to go to God and say, God, I'm ready. I'm ready to give my life afresh to you. I'm ready. 
If there's sins in your life, you don't know that, and you feel like that you are at a place where you need to make it right so you can be ready, this is your opportunity right now. On the count to three, and I'm asking you to raise your hand. One, really look inside you. Forget what other people say. Because they can't bring you to Jesus. Only you can bring yourself to Jesus. It's a choice you make. It's between you and Jesus. Two, there's nothing to do with about coming to this church, whether you're here or not. It's really secondary. It's really about coming to the family of God, that you're ready to join the family of God, that truly be counted one of his devoted ones, that your lamp is full of oil. So when I say three, I want you to raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me, Pastor. I want to pray for you right where you are, but just raise your hand. Three, raise your hand. Say, that's me. I want to be ready. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that honest hand. Another honest hand. Just keep raising keep another honest hand. Thank you. In the balcony, another honest hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Just say, yeah, I want to be ready. Just be ready. Well, I want to do this. I want to pray. I'd like everyone to stand up to their feet right now. And then if you raise your hand, I want you to say this prayer out loud. Say, oh God. Everybody say it together. Oh God, I come to you right now the best way I know how, just as I am. I need the help of heaven. Today I repent. I turn away from things in my life I know are not pleasing to you. They're sins, and I repent of them. I turn my back on them, and I turn my heart to Jesus. Jesus. I want to be ready. So here's my heart. Here's my life. Here's all that I am. Lord, thank you for saving me today. I confess you as my Lord. But today, I'm asking you to fill me with the precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, that I can be filled with power, filled with your anointing, and live a victorious life before you. In Jesus' name. I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm ready. In Jesus' name, shout to the Lord, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Now, does anyone have the communion cup? If you'd pass it out to everybody. I like my time. I'm close. I'm ready. Jesus. Hallelujah. If you do not have the elements, just raise your hand. We'll give one to you. It looks like everyone's got one. Hallelujah. You know, we receive the communion. I believe this, that when you receive the communion, it puts a covering on your life, puts a covering over this church. We honoring the sacrifice that Jesus gave. And it helps us to step into that reality in the spirit. Because it's in the spirit. This is a spiritual endeavor. This is spiritual. This is spiritual. What you're doing is not physical. It's spiritual. How do I know that? Because Jesus said if you do this unworthily, you can get sick and die in early death. So you know it's spiritual. So it's powerful. So take the bread in your hand. Lift it up to God. And say, Father, I thank you for the broken body of Jesus. As I partake of it, I receive healing to my body. And all that I am, I receive your healing. Let's partake. Now we take the blood, the juice that represents the blood. Peel the cell, the foil back. And say these words. Just lift the cup up. It says, Jesus, this represents your blood. It was shed just for me. It, clean, it cleanses my heart from all sin. Therefore, I'm redeemed. I am bought back from the devil's stronghold. And by this blood, I receive forgiveness. And through this blood, I give forgiveness to all those who have offended me, hurt me, come against me. In Jesus' name, right now, I forgive them as I have been forgiven. And I cover my life 
with the blood of Jesus, I now receive divine protection for my life and for my family. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's partake. Thank you, Jesus, for the healing flow of the anointing of God. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your cleansing. In Jesus' name. As Pastor Willie's coming up here, I just really feel led to do this. We kind of got away from it. But the things Satan doesn't like to hear, fire of God, the cross, baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in a heavenly language. He doesn't like those words. In these last days, let me tell you this. You want to live on top? You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. You must speak in tongues. You must have the fire. You've got to have the fire. When preachers backslide, you can lock, I guarantee you, look at them. They stop praying in the Holy Ghost. You got too busy to quit praying. You can't quit praying in the Holy Ghost. In fact, if anything, you need to pray more. So if that's you and you raise your hand to get your life right with God, I'm asking you to come down here. Or if you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, come down. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. We have elders here, deacons that will help you. Amen? Just, just hit. When you leave these doors, get your, your, your life right with God. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You're flowing in the anointing. It's going to be awesome for you. Amen? Let's give Pastor Willie a hand as he comes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, we just have some uh, elders and deacons come on down front here. We want to pray with you and for you. We're available to pray with you and believe in God. Don't forget, um, if you're a guest with us, we have a guest reception right out through those doors to the left of the sanctuary. Also, um, we want to make sure we take our communion receptacles there and just drop them in the receptacles. Like we want to get those in the garbage and uh, let's pray. Don't forget 1 o'clock. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for your grace, your mercy. Lord, we thank you that you truly are a soon-coming king. Lord, we wait expectantly, oh God. Lord, we're expecting. We're practicing our jump, oh God. We're just waiting, oh God, for the trumpet to sound. And we thank you in advance, Lord, that we're going to be with you. You are soon coming, and we're expecting it. So, Father, move upon us continually, Lord, to share that good news with someone else. Father, be glorified today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Don't forget our youth meeting tonight, and we will see you. Go in the peace of the Lord. If you need prayer for anything, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit with your evidence of speaking in tongues, come on down. We'll pray with you and for you. If you raise your